All right, here comes my transition from the slide back to thinking about standards and consolidated CDA and all of this stuff that we're doing. Uh, spot that pink ice cream and look a little bit to the right. What do you see? Mixed, Mixed nuts. Because that's what we've got. Working on these standards and populating our HL7 work groups is a bunch of mixed nuts that just are really crazy about, um, about this kind of stuff, enough that we give a lot of our volunteer time to making these. Oh, you're referring to us. I thought you meant the standards. <laughs> no, nuts. totally us. <laughs> All right. So. I'm uh, Jean. I, I'm short on you know. I want to use every minute that we have, so I think I'm getting up to the top of my starting no, spot. Is this an okay yeah, to, time off. to reconvene? Yeah, chill out. We're not at twelve. We're almost at twelve forty-five. For two forty-five. Here's your pink, blue. Yeah, and if you scroll just a little bit down, you can see where you can personalize them. They have all kinds of really cool colors. A little bit further right. down, they have some neonish. There, see, all kinds yeah. of cool colors. That's pretty cool. Yep. All right. It is 245. So I pass it to James and Lisa. Do you guys, I, I'm assuming you're going to take, do some presenting. Yes, here we are. And there are questions. So I will have poll questions for people to answer, ask. Yes, poll questions. Yep, we'll get there in a couple minutes. I have about a 20 minute quiz that's going to be coming later on. Um, the, the, link that we chatted out at the beginning of the break will take you to the IAT um, agenda page. And here we are in the topic number four, the closed loop referral. And these are the documents I was talking about here. I'll tell you a little bit about them in a second. But this number three, communication number one, testing data, this is a PDF that has um, some details about what's going on in a specific part of this use case, and it's uh, the information that we'll be using to generate a referral note from. So if you are um, competitive and you like tests, open this uh, PDF up and in the background while I'm getting us started, you want to take a look at the details that are in there. So my name is Lisa Nelson, again, and I'm here today with James Grew um, from Grew Consulting, who is uh, my partner in crime on a pretty interesting exercise that we started up. Let me go into slideshow mode. Is everybody seeing my desktop okay? Yes. There we go. And this really was inspired by Chuck Jaffe at the last HL7 working group meeting when he presented this cool graphic that talked about challenging HL7 to think about how we can um, spread our, our influence and, the, and harness more power towards making standards really work by reaching out to connect with more communities and new communities and bring something together that would make the efforts of all these different communities become more powerful. And that's what we endeavored to do in this aspect of our community building. The CDA Management Group is chartered. One of our main focuses is to build community around CDA. And so we decided to start reaching out to some of the other big groups that focus on CDA and uh, are using consolidated CDA for their documents and information exchange to see if we could connect across all these communities and come up with some way that we could harness our efforts together so that all of this testing and experimentation and focus could lead to more change and more improvement for interoperability faster and better than we've, um, than, you know, more accelerated pace than we've been able to achieve in the past. And so we, we took into consideration our own advice from last IAT where my friend Andrew Statler presented on this, the importance of having a use case to harness your efforts and to help you understand if what you're doing is really right and valuable. And so we, we looked across HL7 and IHE, Direct Trust, Commonwealth, Care Quality, all the different efforts that are going on, and we endeavored to create a use case that would be valuable to improvement er areas that all these different groups are working on. And we, that's, what we, that's what we did this um, 
the results over here, that website, I mean the um, the Confluence page that I put up for you guys is, um, let me show it to you in PDF, some documents that describe a high-level use case that's all about coordinating care. It's a kind of a patient story about Marla Tesla, who is a diabetic patient, and it shows how care is coordinated across a care team that includes her primary care physician and an ophthalmologist and an optometrist and the kind of benefits that can come when the whole when a whole care team can share information to take care of a patient that way. So um, uh, Jim Grew is going to be telling you more of the, the clinical details about what's behind this use case. But from a technical point of view, what we did is we invented a story that could play itself out with a bunch of different communications so that technically these details, after the why is answered and the, and the what's going on clinically, these details could be played out across a bunch of communications. And in this story, we actually have 11 different communications that need to go back and forth. For example, the kind of story starts with this communication number one that's a referral note that goes from the primary care physician to an optometrist. And we detailed out the kind of information that would need to be shared in an exchange like this to initiate the referral. And then you can see um, detailed out a second communication that comes back from the referring physician uh, with the results of the examination in the form of a consultation note. And we identify the kinds of information that needs to be shared back from there. <clears throat> so we took the high-level story, then we broke it into actionable information exchange pieces. And finally, um, in hooking up with the IHE, who had their annual Connectathon at the beginning of March, we detailed the data even further to create test-level data that could be used to identify whether or not the content of the referral note was really being generated accurately when it was uh, shared and used in some 360X closed-loop referral profile from IHE testing that happened at Connectathon. So the, the basis for doing all of this was to come up with a use case that not only hit really important um, value proposition for the industry as a whole, but also gave us this platform for providing enough technical detail that we could unify efforts going on within HL7, IHE, even the direct trust community themselves, because the 360X profile is, is using direct as the transport mechanism, and then many of the additional usability issues that the Joint Commonwealth Care Equality Group are focusing on. It's an opportunity to exercise all of this in the context of this story. So um, kind of one common focus that could be an overarching, unifying experience that we envision might take multiple years to connect through these communities. Steve Moore, who is a part of the team that helped to bring this vision into being, was first up, and he um, reached out, worked with us to develop some ways to incorporate this into the 360X testing. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about how that turned out later on. And, and then um, Scott Stewie from Direct Trust, who's a part of this team also, is looking at how can we learn from and use and leverage this use case so that as the Direct Trust community moves on to look at some testing around that 360X profile that will happen later on this summer, that they can reuse it. Um, we'll be using it to look at content today. That's what HL7 really cares about with respect to consolidated CDA and some of these additional document types. But we feel like putting something forward like this that can reach out and connect with many different communities is something that will help us amplify this message of how do we get to common, how do we get to consistency, and how do we drive quality improvement. I think with that, I'm going to uh, go back into slideshow mode and um, turn the, the floor over to Jim, who can tell us a little bit more about the, what's behind the use case. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Are you hearing me? Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to, for the people that don't know me, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm an optometrist and uh, I spend most of my time these days <clears throat> working with different networks. Um, and the goal of it is really to allow a patient to have a care team that's not only made up of providers from large health systems, but also independent providers and that whole extended care team and be able to work that way, those care team members need to be able to communicate effectively. So that's my interest in this process that's being led by Lisa of, of putting together uh, communications that can be shared through direct messaging through the CCBA process uh, that are effective. And what I observe as I go through the country is there's huge variation on how these communications work. Uh, one city that I work in, there is one eye care provider that does about a thousand direct messages per month with one particular hospital system. Um, and that's out of three hospital systems. The other two don't do very much. And there's a number of eye, of eye care providers in that same area that do none of those communications. Uh, and there's a whole host of reasons that that occurs. <clears throat> the net result is in today's world, a lot of, be, this sounds ironic, but because of electronic data, we've actually gone into a mode where like outside providers, outside of a health system, being able to communicate with that health system are actually doing a poorer job than we did when we had paper charts. Um, faxes come in and providers in those large health systems never see those faxes. They get attached as a document and they never see those during the clinical care. Whereas in the old days, the you know we sent a letter and the letter was set on the physician's desk and they opened it up and they read it. So in some areas, you know, moving to electronic data has not helped providers actually communicate better. So that's kind of my interest in doing it. But when you track the problems, I deal with providers all the time and say, well, I've tried to use direct messaging, but when I open the data that comes in through the CCDA that they get, they don't know why they're getting the data. There's no order to it that makes any sense to them. It's just not very helpful. And to analyze it, to figure out what they're trying to do just isn't worth the effort. So again, even when they successfully do use direct messaging, a lot of times it's not really helpful. So I really think the problems track back to what Lisa has identified. We're not using the proper document type for the proper communication. So for an example, if we um, actually use a referral note, right in the header of the referral note is who's referring it, who it's going to, you know, the patient's name for sure, but also the reason for the referral, it's right there. And then the data is structured so it makes sense in the order that's presented. Uh, if we look at a consult note, the result back from that referral exam, in this case of our story, from the optometrist back to the primary care physician, right at the top of it, it's a summary of what the exam showed. So they can, they can see right in a quick summary when the physician gets this, they can see the three things that resulted. You can read them there. The patient, in this case, had early diabetic retinopathy. It's visible on OCT, but not visible on fundus photos or a uh, fundus exam. Uh, they got cataracts ready that you, for removal, and the patients expressed an interest on uh, better controlling your diabetes. So you, you can see that right away. There's no question of why did I get this information. Um, so that's kind of the the idea of using the proper documents. <clears throat> So in the, uh, when, when we use these proper ones, it makes those communications so that the providers, even though they're from completely different entities, different offices, different size organizations, they can still really function as a team the way that a team is intended to, to deliver consistent patient-centered patient type of care. Uh, the, the use case that we wrote starts with a referral from a primary care physician and it's a referral for an annual dilated eye exam. The patient has blurred vision and halos at night on the referral. Uh, during the exam, they're found to have di early diabetic retinopathy in a method that most physicians are not even aware is possible today. OCTA is a newer method in eye care of being able to see what's happening below the retina. So there's no visible retinopathy, but we can see early 
uh, changes. So classically, what we're looking at here is in the diagram on the left where the fovea is, on the right that corresponds to that cherry red spot in the middle. That's, that's where your central vision is. On the next slide, it shows what classic diabetic retinopathy looks like, and that's what we're accustomed to looking at. On the right-hand side, that's an OCT view, and where that arrow is toward the bottom, we can now see what that vascular plexus is under that retina. The next slide shows what that normal uh, vascular plexus looks like, and these are the same image over a couple of years difference. So there's very, very little change, if any, in a normal healthy individual of the vascular plexus. The next slide shows that when we have diabetes, that ring in the middle changes size, it gets irregular in shape, and you develop a, an asymmetry in size between the two eyes. And then surrounding that, there's a dropout of the microvasculature. So the reason I'm showing you all of this is we're starting to understand, so we're starting to be able to see how the microvascular vessels actually change, but that relates not just to eye care. It happens to be in the eye that we can see them, but as that's occurring in the eye, it's also occurring in the kidneys and other structures in the body. So even though it's an eye care test, it's really important to be able to share that effectively with the rest of that healthcare team. So, uh, and also with registries, right? So right now we have registries that are now studying what's the rate of this progression is now that we can measure it, we can see what's happening with it. Now it raises a whole bunch of issues that don't relate just to eye care. They relate to the whole management of diabetes of can these early vascular changes that we can now measure and analyze help us predict not only how long it's going to take to develop more advanced retinopathies in the eye and changes in the eye, but how does it relate to changes in the rest of the body? Peripheral neuropathies, kidney damage, skin breakdown, those type of things. And that's being looked at. So as we do, as we look at the communications that need to occur in the case that we're looking at, we're looking at what do providers have to communicate to understand this whole new technology and how other providers outside of eye care can use that outside that eye care data to affect their level of management. And then also using this within registries to get a much better understanding of how that level of control affects how all of these different things progress, not just the eye care part, but the rest of the significant the, uh, systemic changes that occur. And I think the other thing that's important in the use case that we're talking about, uh, we're talking, just to give you a summary of what's in the use case, uh, there's a referral from the primary care physician, then from the primary, uh, the optometrist to the ophthalmologist, there's a referral to a diabetic educator, there's uh, communication between the ophthalmologist and the primary care physician for a pre-op for the cataract surgery, and then there's multiple uh, progress notes between the optometrist and ophthalmologist that are co-managing the post-surgical visits. Uh, and then there's also multiple communications between those providers and uh, clinical outcomes registry. So uh, all of those become necessary if we're going to do this level of coordinated care that Lisa mentioned. And the only other thing I'd like to just finish with saying that what we're looking at in this story, if you look at the details of it, we're not just sharing clinical discrete data, we're sharing how both the providers, how the providers think and how the patient thinks. And that becomes really a critical part of sharing data if we're gonna function as coordinated care teams where we're all thinking the same way and presenting a unified uh, message to that patient. So Lisa, I'll turn it back to you. Great overview, Jim. Thanks. As you can see, there's a lot going on in this story. When you read uh, document number, document number one has kind of Jim's whole vision behind the the possibilities, um, and and describes the strategy why it's you know all the big whys from a really how are we do what are we doing and why to affect better care, uh, lower cost care. It gets to all the, the quadruple aim kinds of issues. At the same time, it gives us rich clinical data so that when we build examples and tests, we're not just making stuff up that doesn't really make sense. It's got a, a rich 
clinical setting to it, and um, ultimately it causes the information flows to be lined up with things that we're trying to learn how to do in 360X with sharing care plans, um, generating new kinds of documents that aren't just CCDs. A lot of the details, even down to the level of, um, like from the Sequoia work and data usability, um, how do we use IDs to keep track of the same problem over time? And uh, very nuanced stuff, it's all present here in this use case, and it's something that we think we're going to get a lot of use out of with the support of Steve Moore from IHE, uh, Scott Stewie from Direct Trust, and any place else that, that this story can be used. We really want the community to embrace the idea that we can use a use case like this to bootstrap ourselves into, into exchanging data in a new and better way. Lisa, um, um, yes. real quick, um, I, I definitely have someone else that we can add to that process. Um, it's a mutual client for sure. Um, what, in the meantime, what's being recommended to share this data in the documents we currently have? Referral note and consultation note are, okay. uh, are up right now, but I will mention um, a little bit about star of the show, CCD, who always emerges. Um, I'll explain that on this slide right now. Perfect. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, for people. So it's a it's a kind of an interesting thing. But um, what we did to get started, this is the first cycle through, we worked with Steve Moore at the IHE to um, put some of this test data out so that vendors who were testing their 360X dance moves could uh, put on their hats and, and actually try and tie to some of this information. Um, what we learned is that it was it was a challenge. These these connectathons at IHE are very focused on the particular messaging transactions that have to go back and forth, and the data that's in there. And um, and so while I was able to, I served as a monitor. I got to do these tests myself. I was able to um, watch NextGen, Epic, Meditech, and Cuvera successfully do these transactions to start and accept or decline the referrals and exchange the document types. What we noted was that, um, that although they were producing referral notes to, uh, to go with the initiation of the referral, they had not embraced the idea yet about really inventing or, or making their systems be at the level that they could produce a consultation note at the end of doing the services that, that were referred for. And in talking with the, the vendors who were involved in this testing, there's absolute understanding and support of being able to move there. And I'm pretty sure that by next year, uh, they'll all be embracing this idea that, that a consult note would be a much better option. Within the specification itself, so I'm going to bring up the um, and this is one of the links that's available to you out on the agenda page there, the IHE um, 360X closed loop referral. Within here, there is guidance around um, use of different document types. And let's see if I can uh, click quickly in to give you that example. In Volume 2, for example, in the referral request transaction, there is um, some specific guidance around message content, and I think that this chapter right here talks about um, what, what do you do when you want to include a consolidated CDA document to support sharing information that's relevant when you're initiating a referral, but it respects the fact that not all systems are at the same level yet. And so it describes how certain document types, like for example, you could include a care plan, that would be optional. Um, this not appropriate for initiating a, a referral. But um, you could, the, the most um, recommended is this referral note, but they also say that if all you can do right now is to generate a CCD, then they have some specific guidance for you. So. If the continuity of care document is, uh, is the only kind that you can produce, then they have guidance that says that as a minimum, you have to add a reason for, re for referral 
section into this document. So they're, they're, what they're doing, Rochelle, is they're trying to kind of give interim crawl, walk, run sort of advice that if you need to try and just wean yourself off from only knowing how to do CCDs, that you could add some capabilities around including additional sections and at least be able to communicate that really critical information around um, what is the reason for referral. The reason that this is so important is that the reason for referral section has got an entry template in there that this guidance, um, if I was going to you know, shade it with a bright red marker, this is really critical because the ID that's used to connect this activity across the whole referral is communicated inside the entry that's um, represented in that section with the Patient Referral Act entry template. So they have great guidance. Nance was asking for more specific guidance. This is an example how IHE kind of comes along and looks at specific business cases and, um, and, and looks at the problem at hand and then crafts additional guidance that helps implementers know exactly what to do. Very nice. Right now, Perfect. the spec does still allow for a lot of optionality, um, and I think that's just because of the level of maturity and where we are in, our, in this growth process. Um, hopefully, we could come up with some more guidance around, you know, as we mature, when can we maybe stop having as much optionality and start having the specs reflect consensus thinking that comes in the implementer community. Um, as a result of working through this activity with IHE, one of the things I'll show you a little bit later on is a set of rubric rules that, are, that have been proposed that could be incorporated into the ONC scorecard so that implementers who are trying to get ready for um, use of 360X would actually be able to get some guidance around the quality of their referral note document by bumping it up against the ONC scorecard and getting guidance around, you know, some of these some of these options that they could be doing to make those documents more fit for purpose. This is a pretty um, a pretty interesting profile because it also gives us the opportunity. This is some of the stuff that the like the Commonwealth Carry Quality guys get into, which we don't talk about much within the HL7 community, is around the use of metadata like metadata that's available in the XDM package. They do some work to utilize V2 messages also within the context, context of these messages to give you state changes around um, the workflow for the referral and then of course um, CDA documents. And, um, and it's, a, it's, in, it's an interesting and complex thing, but as you begin to become familiar with it, one of the questions that I'm asking myself is when I look at the actual data in all of these places, is do we need all of it? <laughs> um, sometimes you only use a few little pieces from this V2 message or a few little pieces from the metadata here, and as the CDA documents are getting better and replacing or, or perfectly also representing the information that's in these places, does, it, do, does the weight of all of this still need to be there? Or as some parts mature, can other parts be, um, become optional as a way to evolve? That's some, some of the, the questions that came or some of the things that we began to learn and think about from that IHE Connectathon. I'm going to shift gears now and uh, test your knowledge on referral notes. There is that Marla test document, which I gave you preliminary warning about. This is the same level of detail that we provided to the IHE uh, organizations that we're testing. Very specific stuff. It's very much organized like a, you know, the way a CDA document is. I even left some, um, some XML type codes in there to help you out. Um, but let's just see generally how you do on a couple of poll questions about referral notes. Jean, can we have poll number one go out to the audience? Talk about custodian. This is a field that is, um, you'll have a few minutes to take a look there at the custodian of the referral note document is Wood River Health Services. Um, you can look at the information and kind of read through with the, the tips that I provided there. 
The, the other thing that you can do is you can look at the HTML view, which is also posted out there. Here's your referral note. I'll put that up on the screen in case anybody hasn't seen that yet. And I'll scroll down a little bit for you. And let's see how many people got the referral note custodian right. So far I have six, seven, eight. People are doing pretty good, pretty good. The answer is, of course, true. Wood River Health Services, if you read the story, this referral note is going out from the primary care physician who is at Wood River. And so the keeper, the steward of this document is, in fact, Wood River. And you see that listed here, custodian, Wood River Health Services, right in the, um, the header information that's revealed when, with this style sheet. Let's try poll number two, see how we do on that question. The document type in the referral request should be, and then you have a choice of answers, um, a 34133-9 CCD document, a 57133-1 referral note document, or a uh, some more specific referral note document that comes from this value set of all of the referral note document types that are allowed, or any of the above. Oh, we have lots of people weighing in. We have uh, some folks voting for CCD, some folks voting for referral note, and some folks voting for um, any kind of a referral note that's specified in that value set. Pretty good. I'm waiting until we get up to about... 10 or, 10 or 15 people voting. I think that that's pretty good. Votes are coming in. So since I invented the test, um, I'll tell you what I intended the answer to be, and that is any of the above. The reason is that because, as I showed you in the 360X spec, um, they do allow CCDs. Um, and they had that caveat that you, you had to include the reason for referral section. So that would have been an okay thing to do. Uh, obviously, you also could have sent a referral note, strictly coded 57133-1, but it's also true that any referral note that is in that value set that lists from LOINC all of the document types that are valid referral notes, they're all more specific types, but if there had been, for example, a referral note that was tagged as a referral note to optometrist, you could have used that link code and it would have been right too. So um, that's an important value set to know about. Sometimes people don't realize that, but the, while 57133-1 is the most generic type of referral note, there are many other more specific types that also could be used. Let's try poll number three trying to get all of these done by about, about 20 to 25 minutes after. So the correct birth time information for the patient is, and you definitely want to check, um, check your, your background information. I can scroll up here to make this a little bit easier for people who are looking at my screen. The correct birth time information for the patient is, Lots of, uh, well, one vote so far for uh, 1952, February 14th at 10.05 a.m. Someone is voting for just uh, February 14th, 1952, and several votes for either of them being correct. This is a tricky question. See how we're doing? Lots of people weighing in that either can be correct. I'm over 10 answers. So the answer is 1952-02-14 is the correct birth time information for this patient. It's one of the few fields where information, an effective time, time stamp should not include time it should only include the year, the month, and the day because this is a field in the patient demographic information that is often used for patient matching. And if those time components are off or somebody has it recorded in UTC time and somebody recorded it some other way, 
the time information can actually be a great distraction and cause patient matching some challenges. And so there's specific guidance in the companion guide already that says for birth time, you should really only be putting in the year, the month, and the day. Um, Lisa, so, points out that yep. the birth there says February 24th, so actually none of your answers are right because you have February 14th. Oh, none of my, sorry, sorry, sorry. That was supposed to be, it was supposed to be February 24th. Sorry, that was a slip up on my part. All right, let's try the next poll then, see how we do. Um, this is poll number four. The uh, poll number four is the service event ID element should include the referral ID also encoded in the Patient Referral Act entry of the reason referral section. That's posed like a true-false question, um, so I think I have a problem with that, but I wanted to expose this information for you anyway. Um, I'm going to just bring up the XML so we can take a look there, and I am going to zoom into the service event part of the header. And what you see right here is the coded ID of the, the actual um, re patient referral act, the patient referral procedure, that, that's right there. It's also located in that special entry in the body of the document where we talked about the reason for referral act, um, pa I'm sorry, patient referral act within the reason for referral section. You will see that this uh, where is it? Where is it? Hmm. May not have it. Could be a problem. It's it's supposed to be here and it's not. So I guess I have to give myself um, I have to give myself a wrong answer on this one as well. Um, but that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of level of specificity that we're trying to get to to help these documents become useful to the industry so, so that we all would be expecting that and we all would know that that's a thing that you should be doing inside your documents. So we got it right up here in the this um, service events. It's, it's in the header correctly, but within the body of the document where this information is also needed, we missed getting it in there. Last poll question, number five, said the patient's fears regarding vision loss should be documented in a health concerns section. The patient's fears, um, in the story you'll find out that Marla actually had a family member that um, went blind because of his diabetes, and she's concerned about her own diabetes and loss of, um, of vision, you know, and she's having those problems with seeing the halos and some challenges. And she shares with her primary care physician that she's scared about that. Um, is that something that you would expect to uh, see in her health concern section? Uh, so far, nine people are saying true. That's great. Um, as the author of this test, I didn't know what we could really expect. I agree with you. I, to me, I think this is true. But there's not a lot of consensus yet around what really should be represented and what we can expect to find in the health concerns section. This is an area that the Gravity Project is, um, is doing some thinking on, and it's the, something that the care plan folks are certainly focused on thinking about is how we use that health concerns section. And uh, we know that the ONC, after meaningful use, um, when we came out with the 2015 certif Certified Healthcare Technology Companion Guide, they have upped the ante and asked for health concerns section to be present in every document. And yet there isn't really um, great consensus yet around what should be put in that section, what you would expect to find. So I just ask that one as a little bit of a, a teaser to get people thinking about it. Okay, that was uh, fun. I, you guys did great. I thought that health concerns were designated for the provider's concerns, not the patient's concerns. If it was a there's coding author, I mean, a for provider both. authored there's, doctor. Okay. There's, uh, there's 
room for both. So uh, the gu- the template provides guidance that explains that when right. the when you want to say there's a patient concern, how you represent it, and when you want to say it's a provider's concern, how you represent it. Okay. And it, it's yep. both, and it's it's also medical decision making on the part of the provider. If the provider feels like this something is of concern, is you know, then that's how they indicate that. Right. Okay. Pretty. It's a pretty um, e- emerging area, and something that I think is is great to think about. And I'm I'm glad that we're playing with it in this use case, so that the opportunity for thinking about it. Um, proposed rubric rules for the referral notes. Uh, referral note document type, one of the actionable things that we try to get to when we do experimentation like this is is um, agreement around what could we do to raise the bar and um, build additional, I'll call it implementer best practice guidance into this scorecard. We have the ability to, to as a community, come together and put forward rules that we believe represent best practice. Through structured documents, you, you propose the rules in that governance forum, and if they are approved, then the folks at the ONC incorporate them into the scorecard, and on that last Monday of the month, you can see the scorecard get improved. So this is a cycle that's been invented. We've only run it once. But what I'm trying to do is put more content, more proposed rubric rules out there so that folks can start deciding if we agree and then, um, and then get this machine running to raise the bar with the ONC scorecard. So I took the combination of the guidance from the IHE um, uh, profile, they call those profiles, the IHE spec, which is called profile, and um, some of the things that we demonstrated it, just by making these two documents and came up with some potential shall statements um, because I'm not a big fan of shoulds. It's like, why bother? If we've got something that we really believe should be, um, should be adhered to, then let's get the scorecard throwing warnings out to us when we, when we break those rules so that implementers can more easily um, make adjustments. So we've got um, some proposed things around um, improvements in the header, the additional content in the referral note document around that reason for referral and the piece that you saw that I even missed on Patient Referral Act. I should do a big shout out to Dennis Ball who's on the call today. Um, He did a lot of the heavy lifting in helping us create the CDA documents that are representing these communications that Jim has been um, helping us envision the clinical content for. So um, big shout out to Dennis for that, the great work that you're um, able to download from the Confluence site today. Um, these, are the, these are the rubric rules that would help make sure that not only is that information in the indexable header, but that it's also present in the body of the document. And um, and then uh, some things going on with the care plan section. This is some early thinking about how do we get things into the care plan, um, shaped up so that care plans become a more of a commonplace uh, document type that we can embrace. And my goal here is to turn these rubric rules um, as part of what we want to take as follow-up action to see if we can make this machine work at structured documents. So we would post these suggested referral note rubric rules into the structured documents confluence page, then work through the governance at structured documents to see if we can get them approved, and then once they're approved, see them come out of the um, it, in the scorecard and be able to report out to you, hopefully before the next um, IAT that happens in July. That's a, just a personal goal to see if we can turn the machine uh, that quick. And I think I have one closing slide in our last um, minute or so together here, is that this cross-community approach, although it's going to be a multi-year endeavor to bring these different siloed communities to thinking about a common use case and making improvement this way, the biggest concern that I have is that 
each of these groups focuses on a different area. I told you at IHE, their, their testing and the precision that they're looking for is really around how that message content is and to accurately drive the workflow of the referral. And at HL7, we dig into the XML and try to make sure that the actual CCDA templates are functioning the way they should and that the content is there. At Direct Trust, they focus on the information exchange mechanism of that direct secure message and how it's working to get this information between sharing partners. But no one is really worrying about what makes the loop possible. And that is how this data will be consumed and reused and then coughed back up to go and close the loop. Something like that referral ID or problems that may be um, maybe a care plan action item that needs to be completed when the referral is done, and now it is completed after the referral is completed, how do we ensure that systems are accurately consuming the information in and then exhaling it back out? It's like an inhale and an exhale, and no one is thinking about that. We don't have an organization right now that's really well positioned for getting into how is the information getting in, being used within the EHR, and then coming back out. And um, you know, the folks at NCQA that you got to see in the in the use case for quality measures, they're demonstrating what it takes to do that level of digging in and understanding how the data is working inside the EHR. Um, I'm not sure what is the right place to do that kind of testing, but I know for sure we need it. And as Matt Ron is putting together thoughts about what do what does real world testing need to do, this this aspect of watching how the data <clears throat> comes in, gets used, and then is breathed back out, this is a space where if we can use real world testing as an opportunity to review and manually see the information being used inside the system coming back out to close the loop, um, it'd be, that would be a, a really huge improvement. And something that without that, we'll never really reach the vision for interoperability that we have. With that, John, I'll turn it back over to you. 